Uh, normally, I don't introduce myself, but then I saw um, Lammy introduce himself, and I thought, oh, I'm going to do that. So, uh, I sing in a band. I'm an award-winning feature film producer, which means absolutely nothing, because I lost a significant amount of money making a feature film. Um, I wrote the software Commandments 20 years ago, and that kind of sets the tone for the rest of what I'm about to talk about. I'm very opinionated about software. Um, so over 20 years ago, I thought I already pretty much understood what went into software engineering, and I was very clear to explain all of that to customers. And in general, they tended to agree with me. Um, recently, for better or worse, I wrote um, some software in the open, mainly to prove to some colleagues that I could still write software. That's called YBD. Um, my blog posts, such as they are, I blog about once a year on something that really annoys me, typically is a dev curmudgeon. Um, I'm Python, Ruby, Git, C, and Vi, in spite of people saying that these days we should all use IDEs. Vi is fine for me, thank you very much. Uh, I have trust issues. I really don't trust most software. Um, I care deeply about that because I've got young children. I'm working in the automotive industry, and we're about to do autonomous vehicles, and I'm thinking, what can possibly go wrong? I've spent some years now working with various automotive companies, and as I have been known to say to them, and to say in public and other venues, a lot of those projects are bordering on chaos. We're not sure exactly what's landing up in the cars, let alone what decisions we might make based on that. So um, I am deeply worried about the quality of software engineering, and I'm, I'm trying to fix that. Um, and I compensate for the opinionatedness and the grumpiness by being strictly honest, so I do not lie in business, and I've, do, I've held to that line for over 20 years. This pisses some people off because I tell the truth about things, and as one of my colleagues said, the trouble is, Paul, you make people look bad and you don't apologize. So you get what you get. Um, so CodeThink is a much friendlier organization than I am, but I am the CEO of CodeThink. Uh, CodeThink specializes in embedded system software, and primarily we help much larger companies tackle hard projects around open source, embedded Linux, that kind of thing. Now, we have failed hundreds of times in the open. And I recently realized that actually it's been a, a key factor in what we've learned. So I've been involved in the open source arena now since about 2010, late 2010, and I've been learning ever since then. So I now know a whole lot of stuff I didn't know 20 years ago because of what I've learned working with open source people. So I'm very positive about the open source communities in general. But in the course of uh, the last few years, I've had some really disastrous experiences. And I'm going to share one of them in detail. Um, but all of those, I, I could talk for days about the problems that we've exposed. Um, they're often to do with politics, to do with um, the actual people and the agendas of the, the organizations that are involved in um, large-scale open source projects these days. Uh, it's no longer um, a hobby kind of scale environment. I, I don't think it has been for a lot, of, a lot of years. But what may not be obvious to um, contributors on the ground is just how much machination and politics and company stuff is going on behind the scenes of their favorite projects. Um, so, in spite of all the failures, uh, and if you were to Google and read some of the emails chains that I've been involved in or that other people have been involved in from CodeThink, you'll see we've, we've managed to um, frustrate and upset quite a lot of people. Um, but here's one specific example. Uh, a few years ago, we were heavily involved in a thing called Genevi, and that's around auto uh, aut automotive software. And I tried really hard, and this is five years ago, um, to explain to them that security was going to be a problem. So this is the deck I started trying to show. And I prepared pretty well, um, better than I preferred for this talk. Uh, I had detailed discussions with Greg Crow Hartman about LTS and LTSI. And the, I was wrestling with, what do we do to upgrade the Linux kernel over the long term? So I had this whole slide deck, and I started presenting it to the great and the good in Geneva, which is notionally open source expert coming up with the core Linux solution for cars. So I was explaining how security, coupled with the amount of software that we have in cars now, and yada, 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 and how fast Linux is changing, and the fact that we're connected, meant that um, we have a load of changes happening as time goes by in the kernel. And even the stable stuff is changing a lot. 
and everybody's going to have to upgrade over and over again. I got about halfway through my talk, I got to about this stuff, and then the room en masse pretty much told me, Paul, you don't know what you're talking about. Security in automotive is not a problem. You're exaggerating it. Uh, we've been doing security in other domains for decades. And I was heckled. Now, it wasn't the first time I was heckled in, in Geneva. Thank you for being so polite and quiet and not heckling me. It's quite often that people literally don't like my slides enough that they start shouting at me from the floor to derail me. Um, so you've been very friendly so far. Hopefully I won't annoy you guys. Um, so literally, I struggled through about half of this and then gave up. I was trying to explain how complicated LTSI was and how stupid it was uh, because actually it meant that silicon vendors were going to land their stuff in the wrong place. They were not going to land it in mainline, and therefore, in some cases, it was literally just going to create chaos. Um, but I got stopped. So it ended up with... Um, obviously, I, I wasn't positive, I wasn't popular, but I ended up writing that in public. Um, now, bear in mind, I'm a small... I'm a representative of a small company. We're, we're about... Well, now, now we're approaching 100 people, but this time we're about 50 people. And I pretty much wrote to Geneva in public and said, look, you're just dicking around. Now, that email sat on that list now for a couple of years. No one bothered replying in public, but you can imagine all kinds of things went on in private. So, um, what I've discovered, uh, my opinions are my own. Um, different people in code think it disagree with me vehemently. I have arguments in CodeThink as well as with customers and with open source projects, so it, it's probably me. But um, what I've concluded is that FOSS is not a community, and anyone that talks about the community is misunderstanding the scale and complexity of, of the situation. Let me just check my timing. Um, it's thousands of communities. Um, lots of them overlap. There's uh, lots of different um, ways that people interact. You know, tiny projects, huge projects. Some of the larger communities, in effect, are members-only clubs. Now, the Geneva is one example, but I, I could point to lots of other organizations and say it's the same kind of thing. If you're not paying the fees to be part of the club, you're not getting in, in effect. If you're not following the rules that they set for you, you're not getting in. Um, so one example, uh, Linaro, ARM's um, stated official open source uh, organization, we tried to contribute to Linaro. We wanted to do open sourcing, open source development, in, including, if necessary, reverse engineering of their graphics stack. And we started a project called, or we helped one of our engineers start a project called Lima. Uh, unfortunately, ARM did not like that very much. Linaro certainly didn't like that very much. And we were told that, actually, no, if we wanted to contribute in Linaro, A, we would have to pay, B, we would have to provide the engineer, and C, our engineer would have to do only what they told them to do. Bye then. Um, so, in some cases, it's very much a, a situation of our rules, our game. Okay? And the lesson that I learned from that and other experiences is make sure you know what the game is and whether the rules that they're playing by are things you want to actually play by. Um, now, here's the thing. Don't you dare call my baby ugly. If you turn up, as I have done, in multiple open source projects, I said, you know, this is pretty rubbish, isn't it? Can we, can we do better? It tends not to go down very well. Um, unfortunately, I've done that t to at least one project where CodeThink was primarily driving the development. And imagine how that played with my colleagues. Um, the upstream folks, almost certainly in, in most of the established projects, are relatively good at what they do. Uh, that's one of the things that, that is really quite exciting about open source, that there are lots of projects where there are amazing engineers working at, on upstream. Um, that does not mean they're right all the time, and it does not mean that they're thinking about the changes that have happened since they started this thing. Uh, and in some cases, when you turn up and say, look, it's 2015 or 2018, um, we really could do something different. Uh, it can be extremely disruptive for that community, in, in the sense of it literally changes or could co have an effect on their worldview. So um, that's not a very productive way of being either. I've learned that on multiple projects now. And in the end, the reason I wrote the YBD thing was to literally prove to an open source project that their stuff was not good enough and that I on my own could do it better. And sadly, I succeeded. And in the process, it caused at least one of my colleagues to resign, saying, actually, 
Um, that's a bit unfriendly. And he's quite right. Shouldn't have done it. Anyway, um, it's hard to collaborate in a snake pit. Um, uh, let me just spell it out. Wind River. I'm sorry, there are lots of great people working in Wind River, but in my personal experience, trying to collaborate with Wind River, absolutely disastrous because they're just, the, in practice, all that was happening was they were trying to sabotage what we were doing. We're offering work for free, we're bringing software into the open for free and trying to advance the state of the art, trying to advance the industry. And literally, they were hell-bent on holding things back and making it worse. Now, um, very risky naming a name like that, but Wind River already know that I hate them, so it doesn't really make any difference. It's, it's not the first time I've said this. And as I say, there are some good people in Wind River, and at least most of the people I used to have to fight with are no longer there. Um, one other thing I've discovered is it's, there's just as much hype and nonsense in FOSS as there is in the rest of the world. Uh, we learned the hard way that just because some big companies present that they're doing this fantastic project and spending a fortune on creating the next big embedded distro, let's call it, oh, I don't know, Migo, um, that does not mean that they're going to follow through. And when they rename it and call it Tizen, that doesn't mean they're going to follow through either. When you look at the long game, um, I have deep-seated trust issues. I'm trying now to work out which organizations, which projects could we actually trust for the kind of super heavy software that we're, we're talking about in autonomous vehicles and other industries. And these problems are not really getting sorted properly yet. Um, we're right now in discussions with a, a part of one of the Linux Foundation's organizations where because we are relatively expert in long-term Linux, we were invited to work on civil infrastructure platform, which is software for power stations and trains and, you know, really serious stuff. And then at the moment, what we're locked with is there's one guy in the world that has been prepared to maintain a single Linux kernel for 10 years, and he happens to work at CodeThink. And CIP, in effect, needs to maintain a kernel for the rest of eternity and is really struggling to find anyone to do that. So it's hard, and I philosophically would say it's, it's actually just a mistake to even try that, because Ben, who is the, the chap in question, has categorically said, having done it once, he would never do it again. It's, it's the wrong way to do it. Um, if you build it, they will not come, necessarily. Uh, I've certainly learned this multiple times, but this is not just open source. Um, just having a better mousetrap does not lead to a community. Uh, and you're probably thinking, I can see why no one wants to be in a community with Paul. He pisses everybody off. Um, it's not quite that simple. Um, I think you need to get all of your ducks in a row. You, you need to have great software, and you need to have the right outreach, and you have, have to have the right attitude in the project. And for better or worse, although I really do respect and love great engineers, at times engineers are not the best advocates for the work they're doing in my own personal experience. Uh, so, key lesson I want to leave you with, um, I'm still on time, it's pretty good. Uh, upstreams are not generic. You know, it really does come down to specific people on a specific project and specific organizations, if you get to the kind of scale I'm, I'm talking about with, with some of these examples. Um, so understanding who the people are and why they're doing what they're doing, understanding the organization and why it is doing what it is doing, is crucial to working out whether there's any real merit in spending any time aligning with or, or, or working with a, a specific project. And often the agendas, as far as I can see, in some of these very large organizationally sponsored projects, is not what is being stated in public every day on the mailing list. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in having discovered this. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that the software that's market or the project that's marketed biggest is even remotely successful. Market marketing is not connected to engineering. Some of the most successful open source projects were and were developed by one individual person and are still being heavily relied on. There's loads of software in pretty much every Linux stack that most software people will not recognize because it's too low down, um, but it's absolutely crucial to everything else that sits on top of it. So success is not necessarily what people are, are saying with their, their fancy slides. And one thing I definitely learned over the years is that 
engineering takes way longer than people think. So when the marketeers say, oh, next release is going to do this, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Um, in spite of upsetting so many people, uh, I and CodeThink are still very positive in it, about a, a range of projects, and we're, we're actively involved in a range of things. So as you can see, we've been sponsoring this event, and I'm I was a bit less convinced yesterday, but I've, I've been, I think it's simply down to which talks and who you talk to in any conference. And I've had a very positive day today. I've learned, learned quite a lot of things, so I'm, I'm actually glad, very glad that I came. Um, the two itches that we're still scratching, and I, I will mention this mainly because uh, it's, it's not that we're trying to um, kind of cult cultivate a branding around it, it's, it's trying to get people to understand that we're not just doing this for whimsy. Um, if we're going to rely on software to the level that everybody is, because most of you drive and most of you get into airplanes uh, and get on trains and all that kind of stuff, um, I don't care so much about the games on your phone. Um, and I've given up on the privacy thing because we're all screwed for that. Um, but I do believe that we need to know what software is running in the devices that, we, that actually matter to our lives and to our community's lives and our children's lives. So BuildStream is part of a multi-year activity that we and others have, have been involved in trying to get to completely guaranteed custom systems where we can be sure that this is what's in the system. So it may sound a bit like the reproducible builds project, and certainly we're, we're very interested in that work also. But trying to describe a complete system and know for sure that that is what is landing on an ongoing basis forever is, um, is a crucial thing for us. And then the trustability of software engineering in itself is a big topic for me. Um, I do not trust NPM or GEMS or any of the package managers, and I don't trust Docker images. Um, you, it, it's kind of naive to be installing all of that stuff and then thinking you've got a safe production system. So one of the areas that I'm trying to drive, and Trustable is, is certainly something I'm personally nailed to, so if and when it fails, it'll be me failing again in public. Um, I'm trying to get more people to understand that we do need to understand fully where software comes from, who wrote it, why they wrote it, how it was reviewed, how it was tested, the whole works. So the full supply chain for all of the FOSS software that we are going to be increasingly rely on, relying on. So that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you to Paul Sherwood. We still have a couple of minutes. Anyone has questions before breaking to the coffee break? No, no questions? Maybe, oh, oh yeah. Oh, there is one. Suddenly. Uh-oh. <laughs> Um, I un understand that the um, aeronautics industry develops software in a very different context. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear. Can, can we get him turned up, please? Sorry, can you start again? I understand that the aeronautics industry develops software in a very different context. Yes. Can you comment? Uh, yes, I believe that overall, historically, the aeronautics industry has done pretty well at software, um, but they achieve that by methods which are relatively labor-intensive, so there's a lot of paperwork and it's relatively expensive to do. And they are also coming up against some of the same things that automotive is hitting. So one, their devices are increasingly connected, which means they're at risk. And two, the pressure on their costs is much more significant than it, than it has, has used to be. So there, I, I think there's a clear need for more automation of how they do their validation and, and their review and all of that, that kind of process. And we've had interesting discussions with parties in, in those industries around that. Um, so all I would say is, yes, they're relatively good, but arguably some of their constraints have been less than other industries. And I think it, it's going to get worse. It, you know, I've, I've said elsewhere that until more people start dying as a result of direct software mistakes, the, the governments around the world aren't, aren't, to, aren't going to raise the bar enough. But I think that's going to happen over the next five years. I'm, I'm very confident that there will be much more regulation of all software. Okay, thank you very much indeed.